Let's begin uh, by uh, praying to God to give us guidance this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, reminder as we have sung that the Lord Jesus is worthy. And so uh, it is so good for us this morning you know, to bow before you, to thank you for such a Savior, and to invite you by your Spirit to uh, open our eyes still further to see his glory. And by your Spirit and by your grace, to live the life to which you've called us. Father, these are uh, extremely difficult times, times which um, uh, in themselves are very uncertain. So we are more grateful than ever that we have a certain knowledge and assurance of your presence with us. Lord, many of us uh, yeah, this morning know though that many of our friends do not have that assurance. We pray that even the, uh, the stresses and the uh, fears of this time under COVID restrictions uh, would open their hearts, soften them to the gospel, and that you would give us boldness and, and creative ways you know, to speak truth and grace into their lives and to be the church. As we open your word, we ask you by your spirit to be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Peter was a fisherman. He and his friends, James and John, well, they were, uh, they were partners in a fishing business. That was their life. A life of boats and nets and long nights on the water. And I don't know about you, but I, I imagine they never really considered any kind of a major career change. They were fishermen, and, and as far as they thought or could imagine, they would always be fishermen. How could any of them possibly know that one day, I mean a day that began like uh, pretty much every other day with the selling of fish and watching of nets, not only their careers, but their lives would be changed forever. Jesus had officially begun his ministry, you remember in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, you know, he opened the scroll and announced that he was, in fact, the Messiah. He was God's anointed. Now, imagine the scene. This is Jesus' hometown. All the people of the village are there. The families who watched him grow up. The friends he played with in the street. Well, don't you imagine? At first, they were probably excited. I mean, this is their hometown boy. They're proud. But when they heard Jesus, this son of a carpenter, claim to be the Christ, they were horrified. They rejected him. Some even tried to throw him off a cliff. So he left Nazareth and went north to Capernaum by the sea. And there he cast out demons. He healed the sick. He preached the good news of the kingdom. Then one day, and I'll invite you to turn to Luke chapter 5. One day, Luke says in chapter 5, verse 1 of his gospel, on one occasion, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out, to, out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, we'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and, and they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boat to the land, they left everything and followed. Now that was the beginning 
for Peter, the beginning of a new life with purpose, a new life with meaning and with, with great adventure. As he began to follow Jesus, he saw him heal the lame and forgive sins and even uh, raise dead bodies you know, to life. He saw him calm a furious storm. And, and when Jesus walked out on the sea, you remember Peter even climbed out of the boat and walked out on the water to meet him. Well, he walked a few steps anyway. One day on a mountaintop, Peter saw Jesus transfigured, glorified before his eyes, talking with Moses and Elijah. He saw all that, and he heard so much, too, teaching with wisdom and authority. Peter had never heard such words in his life. When, when the Pharisees preached, Peter yawned. When Jesus preached, his heart burned. Of course, it wasn't always easy, but Peter knew there was no going back. He would always follow Jesus. Now, some of the people thought Jesus' teaching was too, too radical, just too hard, and they left him. But when Jesus turned to the disciples and asked if they wanted to leave too, Peter spoke first, of course. Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words that lead to eternal life. But that was before. Before the cross, yes, uh, but that wasn't the problem. Jesus had risen from the grave. Peter had seen him twice already uh, since the stone had rolled away, and he'd heard his voice. Jesus was alive, but that couldn't change what Peter had done the night Jesus was arrested. Nothing could change that. That was the problem. Peter was having a crisis of faith, but, but not about the resurrection. You know, Peter had no trouble believing in a risen Savior. He just had a problem uh, imagining that a Savior uh, could still believe in him. Every time he heard a rooster crow, his own words came back to accuse him. Jesus, who's that? I don't know the guy. It's been almost three years since that great catch of fish that Luke wrote about. And, and now we rely on John's account in chapter 21 of John. Uh, now we rely on John's record of something that happened during that 40-day that period between the day Jesus arose from the grave and the day he was taken up before their eyes. In John 21, we're going to see this. Here's the scene. Uh, this scene finds Peter, James, and John, and a few others, uh, right back where they were three years before. It, still the natural leader, Peter stands and announces, I'm going fishing. Well, the others look at him and at each other and kind of shrug and say, okay, that sounds good. We'll go too. So they get in a boat and they row out to one of their favorite spots. And I imagine it felt pretty good to be back out on the lake doing something they knew so well how to do. But it doesn't turn out to be a good night for fishing. We might say they, they weren't having any luck. <laughs> but as Peter and the others are about to find out, luck has nothing to do with this. In this post-resurrection encounter with Jesus, as we watch him interact with the disciples, and especially Peter, we're going to see something wonderful. We're going to learn something that, especially for some of you, will even today begin to powerfully transform your life. We're going to learn that even though we as believers in Christ may be in retreat, still there are three expectations we may have confidently of Jesus. Well, what do I mean by that? Believers in retreat are Christ followers who at one point were near to Christ. They followed him closely. They listened to his voice and, and, and through his word that they loved so much, they heard it clearly. They were convinced that Jesus had great purpose for them, and, and they were no more passionate about anything than pursuing that purpose. But somewhere along the way, something happened. They drifted. The fire cooled, or in a moment of weakness, they ignored the Lord's voice. They, they followed their own desire, their own way. They yielded to pressure. They fell hard. And now where are they? And now where, where are you? You haven't turned away from the Lord. You haven't given up on him. But like Peter, you just can't believe he hasn't given up on you. And why shouldn't he give up on you? By your own choices, by your own mistakes, you've disqualified yourself. So why not just accept it? Why not just settle for a life of mediocre Christianity? After all, that's where most people are, and it's safer anyway. There's less risk involved in following Jesus from a distance. That's the voice you hear. 
And you know, thousands of Christians hear that voice, and sadly, they believe it. And if you're among them this morning, please watch carefully as this passage of Scripture unfolds. Take to heart and begin to expect and to watch for all Jesus has for you and for any of us who have ever felt that we've sinned too greatly, we fail too often, we've drifted too far to ever be close to Jesus again or to ever be used by him in any way. First, expect Jesus to come after you. Expect Jesus to come to you. This is what we might call uh, his reaffirmation. This is in the first four verses of that chapter in John. Jesus has appeared to the disciples that we've seen already twice before. But still, Peter has given up on his call. He believes that after his failure around the fire, the, the Lord could never use him. The Lord would never want to use him. And I say that because when Peter hollers out to the other disciples, hey, I'm going fishing, he doesn't just mean on that particular occasion he's going to go out and catch a few big fish for breakfast. No, he's going back permanently, he thinks, to what he was before, before Jesus grabbed him and said, from now on you're going to be fishing for men. Yes, Jesus has risen. Peter has seen him. He was there when Jesus suddenly stood among them and said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. But it seems Peter in that moment must have been thinking, well, maybe these other guys, but, but Jesus can't mean me. Not now. See, by now, Jesus has come to the disciples twice to prove he's alive, he's risen, but he hasn't come yet to Peter personally to reaffirm his call. Peter doesn't think that's ever going to happen. So he does the most natural thing in the world for him. He goes fishing. But after a night of incredible frustration, as they turn the boat around for home, the sun reveals a lone figure on the shore. Peter doesn't know it yet, but Jesus has come. Peter didn't expect him because in his pain, he has retreated. He's gone back not only to his most natural vocation, he's gone back to the most natural way to live. He's, he's living by sight. He's living by feeling, by his own understanding, not by faith in what he heard. You are Simon, but you will be Peter. I will never leave or forsake you. How different it would have been for Peter if he'd remembered. If he relied on Jesus' word, uh, he wouldn't have been surprised to see Jesus on the shore. He would have expected him to come, just as you and I can expect him to come to us, to come after us. But Jesus' appearance on the shore assures us of something else, something else we may expect, even though we may be in retreat. And here it is, verses 4 through 7. Expect Jesus to complete his work in you. Now, we may think of this as his recommission. Now, it was natural for fishermen as they were headed toward the shore after a night of fishing. It was natural for them to look up and see people on the shore waiting because the fish dealers who set up their shop in the open market directly deal with the fishermen as they brought in their catch. Lucy and I have seen this in places like Panama and the Philippines. Uh, but it's still surprising that the disciples don't recognize Jesus, don't you think? Especially Peter. Three years before, Jesus had said to Peter directly, let your nets down for a catch. Now, we've seen already that Peter didn't expect to see Jesus. That's part of the explanation why he didn't recognize him. But there's something else. Peter seems to have forgotten what you and I tend to forget. That in all our experience, from, from the most profound to the most ordinary things and in busyness, in quiet, in relationships, in our successes, and in our failures, the Lord is at work. He's at work uh, to discipline us, uh, to build us, to teach us, to heal us, and at times to recommission and to reclaim us for his purposes. The great pastor F.B. Meyer assures us this way. It is his love which is arranging all in order to teach you some of the sweetest, deepest lessons that have ever entered your heart. 
there's not a cross, a loss, or a disappointment, a case of failure in your life, which is not arranged and controlled by the loving Savior and intended to teach you some lesson which otherwise could never be acquired. God, we might say, goes through all that trouble for us. It's one of the greatest expressions of his love. And, and maybe that's why John, the disciple closest to Jesus' heart, was the first one to see. Now, I said earlier that the fact the boys came home with no fish has nothing to do with luck. Well, here's where we see why. The man on the shore was the same one who had calmed the sea. More than that. He's the one who on the fifth day of creation spoke and brought into being all the creatures of the sea. The disciples caught no fish that day because the Lord purposely directed the fish away from the nets. We could say on that occasion, the Lord caused the disciples failure. Why? He was stepping in. He was intervening. He was shutting the door on their retreat, reclaiming them for his purpose. See, what if Jesus hadn't come that day? What if he hadn't come after them? What if the disciples had succeeded that night and come home with their nets, nets full? Likely they would have forgotten all about their call to be fishers of men. But all along, God had been working. Working for their good and directing their course back from discouragement and back to their calling. But there's still something more here. There's still something more you and I may expect. Expect Jesus, even while you're in retreat, expect Jesus to accept you. We may think of this as his restoration. Looking at verses 7 through 14. John 21, 7. John says, That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, uh, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, there's a lot in this passage. Let me just make a few observations here. First of all, what is this about Peter wrapping himself in his outer garment around him just before he jumps in the water? Now, people often wonder why Peter did this, and, and there's actually a good reason. In Jewish law, to offer a greeting was a religious act. And to perform a religious, a sacred act, a person had to be fully clothed. So silly as it may seem to us, Peter puts on his outer cloak and jumps in the water and goes ahead of the others to see Jesus. Peter may have been ashamed, but he was still going to be the first. That was just his nature, right? And then what about this? Uh, why does John mention it was full, the net was full of large fish, Actually, he numbers them, 153, that's verse 11. Do you know the early church fathers had a lot of interesting ideas about that? Jerome, for example, said that in the sea, now I'm not saying this, this is what Jerome, one of the early church fathers said this, in the sea there are 153 kinds of fish. So this catch included every kind, and it symbolized the fact that someday people of all nations will be gathered to Christ. That's one idea. But this one is my favorite. This is from Augustine. Augustine said, 10 is the number of the commandments. Seven is the number of grace, and there are seven gifts of the Spirit. So he believed. Now, follow this carefully. Seven plus 10 is 17. And 153 is the sum of all the figures one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 17. So 153 stands for all who either by law or grace have been moved to come to Christ. Well, those are interesting. 
But I think you'll probably agree it's more likely that all good business people, uh, the disciples just counted their inventory. <laughs> I think that's all it was about. And, and this is so typical of fishermen. Notice that John doesn't just say there were 153 fish. There were 153 large fish. That's so like a fisherman. But let's see what happens now in verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. Now they knew it was Jesus. Well, of course they did. See what Jesus is doing for them? Talk about deja vu. You know, he's already repeated for them the great fishing miracle. Now he's breaking the fish. He's breaking the fish just as he did when he fed the 5,000 and when he passed the fish or the bread to them on the night Jesus, Judas betrayed him. And in all of that, he's saying to them one thing, especially to Peter, you're still mine. My love for you, my commitment to you, my belief in you is the same as uh, when we were together before you fell. In all of this, Jesus is proving his unfailing love, reaffirming, recommissioning, restoring, and doing all that completely. Here by the sea over breakfast, I think of it this way. Jesus is in a way living out before the disciples the meaning of the greatest story he ever told them. The one about a boy who had failed and sinned and run away. He was anything but fulfilled. He was empty. He was starving. The hunger, though, finally moved him to get up and start walking home, but it, he didn't expect things to be the same. The best he hoped for was a place among the hired workers, not to be received again, not to be accepted again as a son. But when his father called for the family ring, the robe, and the shoes, well-known and powerful symbols of acceptance and belonging, for the first time, the boy began to understand the depth of his father's grace and the persistence of his love. <laughs> the father in the story offered a ring, a robe, and shoes. On the beach that day, Jesus offered bread and fish. But the meaning is the same. Acceptance, forgiveness, restoration for all who have failed all who have fallen and retreated, but who choose to look beyond what their eyes can see or what their feelings would tell them and receive by faith the blessing he offers. As Jesus stood on the beach that day and called to the disciples, he stands today and calls to you. He calls you back from sin, back from retreat into a life of have commitment. Back from your belief that because of your failure, you're no longer worthy, no longer worthy to draw near to him, to serve him, even to belong to him. But you know, it may very well be, in fact, it's even likely that when you respond to Jesus' call, when you come back, back from whatever has kept you away, when you come back and receive his blessing of affirmation, you will be of greater use to him than before you fell. Now, I say that because of something Jesus said to Peter before that night around the fire, before the cock crowed, before he denied he ever knew him, Jesus said to him, to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You know, it may be already Jesus is standing on the shore, calling you to stop what you're doing, to look up, to recognize him, and to come. Come and receive by faith his, his kind affirmation, his word of acceptance. Come and accept his forgiveness and his restoration. Come and Listen to his voice as he calls you to serve. Reject the lying, accusing voice that says you're unworthy. Instead, remember his unfailing love and the depth of his grace and say this, 
Yes, Lord, I am yours. Here am I. Send me. Let's bow together. Lord, some of us, having just heard this passage of Scripture and hearing my voice right now, are so discouraged. Many may be uh, ashamed and feel very much like Peter did. That he's disappointed you to such a great degree that things will never be the same. Oh Lord, dispel that fear and that, uh, that falsehood this morning. May, uh, just as John and Peter and the others saw you on the beach that day, may they see you. May they hear your voice this morning. May they know that you have come for them. And you've come not to condemn, but to restore. Lord, may they pray in their heart this morning. Lord, I'm here. Yes, I do ask your forgiveness. I do ask forgiveness for going my own way. For leaning on my own understanding. For turning away from you. For putting distance between myself and you. Thank you for coming after me. Lord, I do thank you for your forgiveness and for a restoration beyond what even now I understand. From this moment, Lord, do help me by your spirit, by your grace and your word and the encouragement of my brothers and sisters to live the life worthy of the calling I've received and to always follow you closely. In Jesus' name. Amen.